Yes. We'll go four, five, and six. Uh, what were four, five, and six? Miracle, mystery, and morality. Um, so, Act 5 is... Hold on, are you? Oh, stop, 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 stop. Go. <clears throat> Page 1590. So we have at the end of Act 4, we saw at the end of Act 4, um, Theseus and Hippolyta and others come into the wood to go hunting. They meet the four lovers. They hear the four lovers story and Theseus says, you know, we don't need to go hunting. Let's head back to town and all get married. So act five, we start in Theseus's palace. And Hippolyta says, tis strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of. And the that means that which. Strange. It's odd. It's, it's uncommon. And Theseus says, more strange than true. Okay? He discounts it. He doesn't believe it. I never may believe these antic fables nor these fairy toys. And antic is how that word should be pronounced. That's how it was pronounced in Shakespeare's day, right? And the reason it should be pronounced that way, even today, even though we don't pronounce it that way today, is because that word antic, spelled like this, has two meanings. One, old, ancient. Two, put the F-R in front of it. Frantic, crazed. Okay? I never may believe these antic fables nor these fairy tales. Notice your gloss says old fashioned, punning to on it, strange, grotesque. Right? So he goes on. Fairy toys, trifling stories about fairies. So he goes on. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet. Lunatic, lover, and poet, he says, are of imagination all compact. That is, they're all made of imagination. Imagination is what constructs them, okay? One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. The madman. He sees devils everywhere, okay? The lover, all is frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. Now, a brow of Egypt, what does that mean? Somebody from Egypt looks how? Dark-skinned. Okay, dark skin. So, the lover, notice, all as frantic, crazed, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. Who's Helen? Helen of Troy, the face that launched a thousand ships. Okay, the beginning of the Trojan War. He is saying the lover sees the ideal of beauty. What, why did Helen's face launch a thousand ships? You know, Paris had that little interview with the three goddesses, and he didn't choose the right goddess as being the most beautiful. Well, he thought Helen was more beautiful than all three of them. In other words, Helen was the epitome, the ideal. In Shakespeare's character of Theseus, Theseus says, the lover sees the ideal, the very model of beauty in a brow of Egypt. Now, remember what I said the other day. In Elizabethan England, whiteness, whiteness, that's not even white enough, <laughs> was the ideal of beauty. Notice, what does that mean? Nobody can really attain that. 
naturally. It has to be created. Okay? Shakespeare has a whole series of sonnets. He wrote 154 sonnets. He has, towards the end of those, from sonnet 127 on. The speaker is not every sonnet, but most of them referring to his dark lady. So the speaker in those sonnets is talking about his love being somebody who is dark skinned. Why? Because all the other sonnet sequences of Elizabethan England <coughs> have the white ideal. Okay? And what Shakespeare wants to do there is he wants to turn it on its head. Why? Because those sonnet sequences are boring, stale, and old. He's kind of taking the onion approach. He's going to parody those. So he's going to shock people kind of out of their complacency. That's not what Theseus is doing here. Theseus is saying, the lover says what? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Doesn't matter what other people think. Okay? But remember, they're all made of this. Okay? So, the madman, the lunatic, sees devils everywhere. The lover sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. If you see the Shakespeare production, um, this weekend is the last weekend. It's at Academy Park in Franklin. Pay attention, because they changed this line. Okay. I personally think they're idiotic for changing it, but and they change it. No, stop there. The poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling. What does it mean to be frenzy? What happens if you have too much on your plate? Not literal eating plate, but you've got so much stuff to do. You've got, you know, I've had students before who were taking 21 hours and working full time. That means you sleep three or four hours a night and you have no life. Okay? That's being frenzied. Okay? So the poet's eye in a fine frenzy <laughs> rolling meaning kind of darting every which way, does what? Doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown. How does imagination body forth? That is, give bodies to the forms of things unknown. What are the forms of things unknown? Most forms you see, you know them, right? I mean, everybody looks at this, you know what this is. It's a bottle. Everybody looks at this, they know what this is. It's a pen, uh, I almost said pen, pencil, okay? Everybody looks at this, they know what it is, okay? What about the person who first thought up this? Where did it exist? At the beginning. In his mind or her mind, in the imagination. And the imagination did what? It brought forth, it bodied forth this or this thing by Steve Wozniak, uh, by um, not Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs and uh, that's not fair, I should forget Woz, Woz's first name. Bob? No, nah, it wasn't Bob. I think it was Steve. Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, I think. Who came up with the first Apple computer. Okay. Or Bill Gates. Well, Bill Gates kind of stole it. Bill Gates who came up with DOS. Okay. Whoever came up with DOS at first, it started up here. Or when Berners-Lee came up with the idea of the internet, it was not Al Gore. <laughs> okay. Tim Berners-Lee. It started up here and then said what? I've got to come up with, today we use the language of a prototype. Why? Because as long as it exists up here, what does that mean? You can't use it, you can't use it, you can't use it. Nobody else can use it, right? And nobody else will think it's real until they can see it, touch it, feel it, etc. So, notice, this is what the poet does. 
The poet looks from heaven to earth. He doesn't mean God's heaven. He means everything out there to everything physical down here. And then from stuff down here to all the way up there. And does what? Creates. And turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Such as Athens. Theseus's court. Hamlet. The palace of Elsinore. You know. Verona. Etc. Etc. Such tricks hath strong imagination that if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. What are the different meanings between apprehend and comprehend? Some classes you have, you have comprehensive exams. What does that mean? Louder? Okay. What else? I mean, yeah, you have to understand the material. But it's in a comprehensive exam, is it just the material covered since the last exam? No. It covers everything. To comprehend means to understand. We only tend to use the word apprehend in one context today. When someone is arrested or caught by the police, the suspect has been apprehended. You don't say, well, I apprehended my pencil and went to class. That's moronic language. You say, I took my pencil. Right? But when you do that, you are apprehending it. It means taking possession of it. So go back to those lines. Such tricks have strong imagination. What does the such tricks mean? Looks from earth to uh, heaven to earth, earth to heaven, embodies forth the forms of things unknown. So, strong imagination has such tricks that if it would but apprehend some joy, if it would reach and grab some joy, it does what? It comprehends. It understands that if I have some experience of joy, there must be something behind that. There must be something causing, giving that joy. Or, you don't like that example? How's this for another one? In the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to bear? How many of you ever, when you were a child, went to bed at night, and you're lying in bed, and you saw something in your room, and you thought, that's not what I think it should be. Or you hear, you know, a noise outside, and what does your mind do? We say, it plays tricks on you. Well, that's because the imagination is what? Notice the difference between apprehending joy and comprehending the bringer of that joy versus Apprehending of fear, what's the apprehending? Seeing a bush, and what? Thinking it's a bear. The bear is the bringer of the fear. What if it really were a bear? What if I were to say, right now, there is a rampaging, roaring, though we can't hear it, lion right outside this door. Okay. And you believe. I mean, really, really believed it. How many of you go really cool and rush out? Probably nobody. Why? Because we have the lights on, we're fully awake, we don't hear anything, you can look through the little window. But if you were five or six years old, and I turned all the lights off, and I had somebody out here with a tape recorder with a roar, you would maybe say, hmm, not so sure. <clears throat> Hippolyta. So he gives this great speech. Hippolyta. But all the story of the night told over and all their minds transfigured so together? No. What does she mean? 
Yeah, exactly. I can understand it if one person said that. I could maybe understand it, too. But all four of them have what? The exact same dream? No, no, no. That doesn't happen. She says, it grows to something of great constancy, however, howsoever strange and admirable. Your gloss for line 25. Constancy. Certainty. She's saying, there's something about what they're saying. There's some truth behind it. But I don't understand it. Okay? So the lovers come in, Lysander, etc. And Theseus asks Philostrate, so what, what do you have set up for our, for our wedding ceremony festivities? They've already been married. They've got three hours, he says, before they go to bed. So they want to have some, you know, festivities. What do you have set up? And notice what Philostrate does. He comes in, he has a piece of paper. And he says, um, he hands it. He hands it to Theseus. And Theseus reads off some titles. Now, pause for a moment and go back to the beginning of the very last scene, the end of Act 4. What does Bottom say when he arrives at Peter Quince's house? He says, our play is preferred. But it's not yet. So the Bottoms is lying. I don't know the answer to that. It's just something I find curious. So, he reads the battle with the centaur, son, blah, blah, blah. He says, nope, don't want any of that. Why? That have I told my love in glory of my kinsman. Theseus is related to Hercules. He says, no, no, no. Hippolyta already knows about that because I told her that story. So how about this one? The riot of the tipsy Bacchanals tearing the Thracian singer in their age, excuse me, in their rage. He says, no, no, it's old. Uh, the thrice three muses, blah, blah, blah. No. How about hmm, the tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love Thisbe? Very tragical, very tragical mirth. A tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love, Thisbe. Very tragical mirth. Merry and tragical? Tedious and brief? Well, that is hot ice and wondrous strange snow. How shall we find the concord of this discord? Remember when Theseus arrived in the woods? He said, you two are enemies. How comes this gentle concord in the world? Well, out of the title of the play of Pyramids and Thisbe, he's wondering, how will we get concord, agreement, harmonious sound, out of this discord? What's the discord? You can't have something both merry and tragic. Unless you're sick and twisted and take pleasure in other people's pain. Okay? And it can't be tedious and brief. Brief means it's quick. Tedious means it's like time stops or goes very, very slowly. Who, who does this? Hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which never labored in their minds till now. They never tried to do anything with their brains. That's it. No, 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 you don't want this one. I've heard it over. It is nothing, nothing in the world unless you can find sport in their intents. What does it mean by sport? Pleasure. Unless you can take pleasure in their, what does he mean by intents? Their intentions. Theseus, I will hear that play. Why? For never anything can be amiss. When simpleness and duty commune. Those of you who are parents or think you might one day become a parent, that would be a good idea to learn 
and to accept. Why? Because you're going to have a child come to you at some point with a piece of paper like this, scribbling on it, and it's going to look just like scribbling. But to that child, that is the greatest work of art in the world. And that child's going to hand it to you, and you're going to go, No, Daddy. Sorry. What have you done by turning it, turn it upside down? That means what? I don't see what the kid sees. It also means I don't take the intention as the reality. Okay? Notice what Theseus is saying here. He's going to take whatever it is they do as being totally fulfilled and complete. Here's, here's a ludicrous example. It would be like my accepting your quizzes. Now let's say you just bombed the quiz. Zero. Not because you got here late and didn't take it, or you read the wrong reading. You read the reading and you just totally bombed it. That would be my, not, not a zero, a one out of ten. Or a twenty out of a hundred. That would be like my taking that and saying, ah, oh, but you intended to do well. Therefore that twenty becomes a hundred. Ain't going to happen, okay? Why? Different context, different situation. What's he saying? Where, where is Theseus on the social status totem pole? He's at the top. Where are the hard-handed workers of Athens? They're at the bottom. Notice, as long as duty and simpleness tender it. What does he mean by, by simpleness? Our bottom, Peter Quince, and Flute, the bellows mender, and Snug, the joiner, and Tom Snout, and Robin Starling, are they doing their best? Yeah, they really are. This is the absolute best they can do. Right? Hippolyta, I love not to see wretchedness overcharged. I mean, she's saying, no, no. What does she mean by wretchedness? Poor slots. That's what she means. I mean, she is looking down her nose at these lower life scum. Okay. The uh, and Theseus says, Why, gentle sweet, you shall see no such thing. But he says they can't do it. The kinder we to give them thanks for nothing. How often do you give somebody thanks for nothing? I mean, we have a phrase, thanks for nothing. That's not what he means. He means just the opposite. They're trying to give him everything. According to Hippolyta's mentality, they've produced what? Zilch. The kinder we, and kinder there means Two mean, two meanings, both nicer and more natural. Like when we ask what kind of thing is it, we mean what is that thing's nature. He says we are more human by taking what they've tried. How do I know? Our sport shall be to take with this what they missed. How do you take what they mistake? Every one of you does it, by the way. Somebody tells you something, you don't hear all of it. Somebody gives you something to read, and it's got errors in it. And what do our minds do? We fill in the blanks. Especially if we understand the ideas they're trying to get across. So, and what poor duty cannot do, that is, the poor duty felt by the rude mechanicals, noble respect takes it in might, not merit. What does that mean, takes it in might? In what they could have done, though not in what they actually did. All right? Where I have come, and he talks about 
going to places. And he says, clerks, have memorized these great welcome speeches. And then I've entered their presence and they, 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 they couldn't talk. Why? Wowed by my magnificence. This he used to say. He says, in that stuttering babbling, I took a great welcome. Notice, does Theseus come off as this haughty, upper class, I better than you kind of person? No, he doesn't. He has the, the right understanding of what nobility really means. Okay? So, they come in. And Peter Quince delivers a prologue. And I'm not going to go over the prologue other than to say he screws it up entirely. How do we know? Well, one thing, if you read it and pay attention to the marks of punctuation. Punctuation in Shakespeare's day didn't indicate grammatical clauses like it does today. For example, in Shakespeare's day, you would never have on a paper CS for comma splice. You know, where you join together two independent clauses with a comma? Nope. They didn't exist. Commas in Shakespeare's day indicate simply pauses. So you're reading something, you see a comma, it means pause. You read a semicolon, it means longer pause. You get to a period, it's called a point, and you stop, take a sip of coffee, and then go on. So, if we offend, it is with our good will. Period. What does that imply? Okay, but he doesn't read, the, he doesn't say period. The period's just there. But he stops at the end of, it is with our good will. What does that mean? We intend to offend you. That's not what Peter Quince is trying to say. He says, if we offend, it is with our good will that you should think we come not to offend. See, the punctuation that we have matches his delivery. It's not the way it should be punctuated. It should be punctuated if we offend, comma, it is with our good will that you should think, comma, we come not to offend, period. In that idea, we don't come to offend you. But with good will, comma, to show our simple skill, that is the true beginning of our end. That is, that is our whole purpose. To do what? To show our simple skill. We're not Lawrence Olivier's. We're not the greatest actors in the world. We're just simple, hard-handed men, etc. So Theseus says, this fellow does not stand upon points. That is, he's not paying any attention to the punctuation. Okay. So they go back and forth. Indian. Peter Quince goes on with the prologue. And what is the purpose of the prologue? Remember, Bottom said we have to have a prologue. Why? Several reasons. One, so that they know I am not really Pyramus, and that I do not really die, and that this of the joiner is not really, I think it's not, might be Bottom said, is not really a lion, and the lion will not really kill Fisby. So, Snout comes out and delivers his speech. Now, should Snout talk at all? No, because he's a wall. Walls don't talk. So why does Snout talk? Well, they have to make clear. So that, that whole, in, in theater, that whole thing called the fourth wall, which is the wall that separates what is happening on the stage, what's going on out here, it's obliterated because they have no idea of that. Okay. So, Pyramus comes out, delivers his speech. 
And notice the language he uses. I'm going to make sure I gave him the time for the quiz. O grim look night, O night with you so black, O night, whichever art when day is not. Really? Night, whichever art are, when day is not. Well, yeah, that pretty much is when night is, when there is no day. O night, O night, alack, alack, I fear my... Th okay. So, Theseus makes a comment, and Pyramus breaks character and replies. So, Thisbe comes in. Keep in mind, Thisbe here is not played by a young boy. How do we know? Because Flute said, I have a beard coming. He's in his late teens at least. Okay? So he has to come in and go, Lost my place. Oh, well, full often hast thou heard my moans for parting my fair pyramids. My cherry lips have often kissed thy stones. One of the dirtiest lines in Shakespeare, by the way, which completely over most people's heads. There's another one coming up in just a moment. Pyramus, I see a voice. You, no, you don't see voices. This is how bad the text of the play is that they have. So, Thisbe talks about kissing the walls whole. Yeah, it's another dirty line, which is one of the great laugh lines in the play because everybody gets that one, except for the little kids who are in attendance. Okay? And Hippolyta says... This is the silliest stuff that ever I heard. What does she mean? Silly in Shakespeare's day means foolish. These are morons. These are idiots. They ought to be in, in Shakespeare's day, I'll use the language for the place, Bedlam, the hospital of Bethlehem, which was nicknamed Bedlam because of how it was pronounced. The insane asylum. Okay. Theseus, the best in this kind. What does he mean, this kind? Well, what is the thing that bottom and the others are doing? It's the play within the play. The best in this kind, a play, are but shadows. What did Puck call? Oberon earlier, king of shadows. When Oberon said, what hast thou done? Whoa, king of shadows, not my fault. I anointed the Athenian swain's eyes, etc. And the worst are no worse if imagination amend them. Amend. What are the ten amendments in the Bill of Rights to the Constitution? There are ten things the writers of the Constitution screwed up on. They are ten fixings to the Constitution. Okay? And then we get, what, 17 more after that. It must be your imagination then, and not theirs. Again, the poet has what kind of attitude? Well, she's up here all high and mighty. She's, I mean, she's really looking down her nose at this. It must be their imagination that can make any sense out of this. Theseus, no. If we imagine no worse of them than they of themselves, they may pass for excellent men. Does Bottom think he's a fool? No. Does Peter Quince think he's a fool? No. Does flute? No. Do any of them? No. Except for, um, which one is it? Robin Starvin, who plays the lion, who says, you know, can I have my lines now? Because I'm kind of slow of learning, and it'll take me a while to learn them. And what does he say? All you have to do is roar. How can you remember? Roar. <laughs> Maybe Starvin. So, if we imagine no worse of them than they of themselves, then they may pass for excellent men. Now, this could just be me, but I think Shakespeare is also trying, through Theseus, to maybe talk to the people up in the galleries. The people who paid more to get into the globe. 
or to get into the theater, to watch this play. Quit looking down from where you sit on the groundlings and seeing everybody standing down there as less than you are. So, Lion comes in, and we see Lion roar, we see Fisbee run, leaving her mantle. Pyramus comes in, Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams. No. You know. And whoever gets to play bottom slash pyramus really gets the choice role of the play. I, I strongly recommend, if you haven't seen it, going to um, Franklin this Thursday through Sunday and seeing it. So, what does bottom do? Bottom assumes this bee is dead, so he takes the sword and he kills himself. All right? Pyramid stuff, sorry, not bottom. And notice, he doesn't only kill himself, he, line 281, I that left pap, where heart doth hop, thus die I. In every production I've seen, that's one step. Ugh. Thus, pulls the sword out. Ugh. Sorry, lost my place. Thus, three times. If you stab yourself in the heart, pretty much once is going to do it, okay? So, thus, thus, thus. Now am I dead. Now am I fled. How does he know? My soul is in the sky. Well, if the soul is in the sky, then what's left on the stage, supposedly? Yeah. A corpse, a shell, a carcass, a bag of meat. Tongue, lose thy light. Moon, take thy flight. Now, die, 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 die. And, again, I've seen this probably a dozen times. And Pyramus' death takes anywhere from two or three minutes to ten. Or he dies repeatedly over ten minutes. Okay? So, those watching the play talk a little bit. This becomes it. Asleep, my dove, my love. She sees him. What? Dead, my dove? Oh, Pyramus, arise, speak, speak. Quite dumb. Dead, dead. A tomb must cover thy sweet eyes. These lily lips, this cherry nose, these yellow cowslip. Lily lips? Should lips be white? I don't care if you're the whitest white person the world has ever seen. Your lips should not be white. Okay? Nor should your nose be red. Red nose is a dead giveaway for what? Drunk. Okay. These yellow cowslip cheeks. If your cheeks are yellow, what medical condition do you have? Jaundice. Okay. Are gone, are gone. Lovers make moan. His eyes were green as leeks. Oh, sisters three. Who are the sisters three? The fates. So she takes the sword. And says, come, blade, my breast of you. Stabs herself. And farewell, friends. Thus this be ends. Adieu, adieu, adieu. And then she finally dies. Theseus, moonshine and lion are left to bury the dead. I and wall too. Why? Because wall's still out there. Bottom. Gets up. As does flu. No, no, no. They're not dead. Okay. So, no epilogue. They'll have a dance, and Puck comes in, carrying a broom. Why? What's he sweeping away? The shadows of the night. The dust of what they've, of everything that's been going on. So Oberon and Titania come in with their fairies. And they do what? They go all throughout the house, sprinkling fairy dust all over. Why? They're blessing the three marriages. Okay. And Oberon and Titania bless Theseus and Hippolyta's marriage. Which notice we don't see Theseus and Hippolyta because it'd be pretty hard to have Oberon, he usually plays Theseus, to bless himself and etc. So they go through and do all that, and then Puck comes out again by himself. If we shadows have offended, who are the we shadows? 
Two means to that. The actors, the characters on the stage, or who were on the stage, the fairies. He calls Oberon king of shadows. So, the fairies and all of them. All right? Back earlier, Theseus said, Line 205 in Act 5, Scene 1. The best in this kind that is in place are but shadows. If we shadows have offended, think but this and all is well. Think what I'm about to tell you and any offense you take will be wiped away. You have but slumbered. While these visions did appear, a midsummer night's dream. The play is the dream of the audience. Guess what? We all have the same dream. Just like the four lovers in the wood. And Hippolyta said, yeah, but that's really weird that four people all have the exact same dream. And what did Theseus say? He then gives his speech about imagination. In this weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. What is the theme of A Midsummer Night's Dream? Is it love? My, my Shakespeare text that I use for my intro to Shakespeare course goes on and on and on about how imagination and the imagination's ability to construct reality, blah, 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 is the theme. I'm thinking you're crazy. That's not it. It is more about love or varieties of love. Okay? Or how one knows what love is. You know, cue the foreigner song. This weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream. What does that mean, no more yielding? Not yielding like you yield when a car, you know, when you're coming onto the highway, you yield to traffic that's already there. Not that kind of yielding. It's no more um, real. Because how real are your dreams? How many of you dream, and then those dreams actually come true? Because that's what people kind of more generally call it. Prophecy, you know, visions. Gentles do not reprehend. Gentles, strictly speaking, are the people sitting in the three galleries in the theater. They're not the people standing. But Puck addresses them all as gentles. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest Puck, go back to Puck's introduction. He is what? The merry wonder of the night who brings mischief. So how honest is Puck? When Puck screwed up in the play, was it honest or dishonest? It was actually honest. He was merely following orders. You should have given me better description of who to eyes to anoint. And as I am an honest Puck, if we have an early luck now to escape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long. The serpent's tongue, which we would usually preface with a boo hiss. Else the puck a liar call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands. That is Pucks and Shakespeare, the playwrights. Begging. Come on, give me applause here. Come on, come on. This is really good for me. You like this. And that's usually when the audience or wherever starts applauding. Okay? You got a bunch of questions for critical thinking writing. Since you're not writing about this, you don't need to worry about that. But, you know, if you want to better understand the play, you might want to think about some of those questions. Okay, we'll stop there with Midsummer Night's Dream. And take this quiz. Yeah, I don't think. Yep, don't need to worry about anything.
Um, one thing about it, let me pass this out. So put everything away, please. Um, number 12, second line should read, it burned down in 1613. Typing too fast. So when you're done, just turn it in and you are free to go. Uh, 